Let's do this. Where's Jack? Can Jack, can you say hi? <laughs> Just to see where you are. What about now? How's that? Okay, good. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. All good. All right. Well, that's wonderful. So, um, hello everyone and welcome to our third session of the seminar series, Future Foods for a Sustainable Planet. Emily, Charlotte and I will be hosting today's session. My name is Saskia. I'm a PhD student at the University of Queensland in the Nutrition and Food Science Department. And hey everyone, I'm Emily, I'm president of the QSA and I'm a PhD student at the Center for Animal Science. And I'm Charlotte, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Crop Science at the University of Queensland. So this seminar series serves for innovation, collaboration and discussion among the four coffee research institute and industry for securing sustainable food production. So in our first seminar, we had Annie Osborne uh, from the Good Food Institute talking about the purpose and importance of investing in the development of alternative proteins and the sustainable way to feed the growing population. Our second session uh, last week was our researchers uh, Q&A, where we discussed the current challenges of our food system under climate change and how we can influence sustainable practice through science and innovation. For our third and last session, we brought a panel of speakers to talk about driving sustainability and innovation in the global food industry. So please welcome today to our speakers. So Jake Alden from Sustainability, it's a sustainability manager at Fonterra and Dr. Pia Wimber, CEO at Venus Shell System and FICO Health, Brad Vanston, founder of Willicroft, and last but not least, Amos Ben Ferman, business development manager at Food HQ. Sorry for your surname, it's a bit tricky to say. It. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Anyway, <laughs> let's well, get started. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Charlotte. And thank you uh, to the panelists today for joining us. And so just a little intro. So we are going to start with a short introduction from our speakers and their company. Um, we try to keep it short, maybe two minutes, so we get more time for the questions. And then we'll jump into the Q&A. And to the audience, uh, please type your questions in the chat as we go and then they will be answered at the end of the session. And so, yeah, Jack, if you would go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Saskia. So, um, yeah, I'm Jack Holden. I'm a Melbourne-based sustainability manager for Fonterra. Um, Fonterra is a large dairy cooperative um, owned by New Zealand farmers. Um, and, and we collect milk from farmers in New Zealand, Australia, um, China, Southeast Asia, uh, a little bit in the Middle East, a little bit in Europe and, and Latin America. Um, we, we collect the milk from our shareholder farmers and we collect it from private farmers who are not related to Fonterra in that sense. Um, we sell in, in well over 100 countries and, and pretty well all we sell is, is dairy products. Um, in Australia, you may know Western Star Butter or Bega Cheese or Mainland Cheese. You might know some of our products there, perfect Italiano cheese. Um, but we also export. We're probably mm, two thirds of what we produce here in Australia. We um, we sell locally, and another third we'll export um, into different markets around the world. Um, and we've been, yeah, you know, a dairy cooperative through different versions for for a long time. Um, I've been with Fonterra for about uh, nine years now, and we still haven't finished our sustainability journey, so we're still going. And um, yeah, look forward to. Um, the next chapter in that, and um, we'll talk more about that soon. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Uh, Pia, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and Venus Shell Systems? Sure, Saskia. Thanks, um, everyone. So I'm uh, Pia Winberg. I'm the founder of Venus Shell Systems, which is a, a Australia's first food-grade seaweed farm, as well as FICO Health, which is our consumer uh, brand-facing uh, company. So we're farming uh, unique Australian green species of seaweed and uh, we then process the seaweed to a number of different ingredients from whole seaweeds to a rich protein fraction um, it, of which Saskia here is going to start her PhD uh, as well as uh, polysaccharide fractions mostly in food products but we also have done clinical studies for 
supplements and, and medical uh, wound healing purposes. Uh, however, the basis of our whole company and my background was in uh, sustainable marine food production systems since about 23 years ago. Uh, where I looked at uh, making aquaculture more sustainable by remediating waste streams from it using seaweed. But um, 10 years ago, started not focusing on the remediation so much, although that's how we do it. We're based in the sustainability of the whole technology, but realised that people don't pay for that. So we then worked on developing the, the food market and the nutritional side of it. But everything we do is founded in, uh, we close the loop on a big wheat refinery, uh, in the in New South Wales on the south coast where they make um, ethanol we capture co2 and through anaerobic digestion and recovery of nutrient streams we uh, add that to the seaweed as well with seawater so we don't use freshwater resources very much at all and we can grow about 50 times more seaweed on a hectare of land area than say wheat farming could do so in terms of area co2 nutrient waste streams and fresh water uh, we're striving to do a new crop for Australia that's uh, very sustainable. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Pia, for your introducing yourself. So, uh, Brett, would you like to go ahead, please? Sure. Um, so, Brad Vanstone, founder of Wheatcroft. Uh, so, we're an Amsterdam-based, uh, plant-based cheese company. Um, so, we've had some amazing innovation over here in Europe for plant-based meat and, and milk. But actually, uh, the plant-based cheese category has, has kind of been um, yeah, a little bit behind. And uh, where we've kind of tried to innovate is uh, we've, we've looked at the, uh, the kind of mass market players, the, the guys making things from coconut oil. And we've looked at what people are doing from an artisanal perspective. And we try to make a hybrid of the two because um, the, the coconut oil-based plant-based cheeses, they're not really looking at impact. Um, they're using ingredients that are coming from a long, long way away from this part of the world. Um, and they're quite compromised on taste. And then the more artisanal guys, um, they're extremely expensive, um, often quite poorly branded and um, quite uh, focused on, on one specific place. So we're, um, yeah, we're looking to, to kind of um, plug the gap in between all of those. Um, and we're very much focused on um, working with the dairy industry rather than against it. Uh, my grandfather was a dairy farmer, so uh, those roots uh, run pretty deep. And um, yeah, we're here to help that industry transition from within. So we're doing a few impact projects here where we're planting our ingredients on former dairy land um, and how, helping the farmers transition away uh, from dairy, but with a project that can sustain them uh, by f both financially and, and, and personally as well. So uh, yeah, it's a brief summary. Yeah, thank you so much, Brett. That was great. Um, and Amos? Yeah, thanks you? for the invite, Saskia, and great to be a part of this um, panel. It's kind of a small world. Actually, Brad, I happened to see you present at the, the Food Valley Summit back in October when I was over in Falkening in, in the Netherlands. So um, great, yeah. to, great to see you again. And I think at that stage you were just getting some products into Albert Hein. So it was a great product. I actually started my career off in Fonterra. So luckily Jack has given us a bit of an intro to that. I'm now <laughs> part of a Food HQ of, of who Fonterra um, Research and Development Center here is a, a partner, but just across the road from me. And I also um, wear a couple different hats. Under Food HQ, um, we work to help small to medium sized enterprises and startup companies access the food science system here in New Zealand and navigate the different parts of the ecosystem. And under that banner, we have a, a collaborative community which is called Emerging Proteins New Zealand, which has a series of projects around um, new protein sources. And one of them is uh, cellular agriculture and others is, is plant-based. So we have a, a sort of a portfolio of work under Food HQ, and then I also sit on the, the board of one of the larger uh, food rescue organizations here in New Zealand. And, um, and then in, in my spare time after all of that, I'm also uh, um, involved as an advisor in a, a startup in a, a cell-based um, dairy company. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for introducing uh, yourself. Um, so let's get the discussion going. Um, we have prepared a couple of questions to get the uh, discussion in place. Um, 
I know they're quite broad, but uh, we are just very interested in, in getting the, the views from you. So I'll start off with the first question. Um, how does your company contribute to sustainable food production and what are your current efforts? So I'll start with Jack. Yeah, um, I, I resisted the urge to present 120 of my favourite slides on this, so I'll just talk to it if that's okay. Um, um, look, I mean, it, the, the dairy footprint environmentally and socially is, you know, is, is pretty broad. Um, you know, the priority issues for us are around, you know, climate, obviously, water efficiency or water access, I suppose. Um, clearly, all animal agriculture has um, the issue of animal welfare that's got to be part of the, um, the the story in terms of what our footprint looks like and how we manage that. I, I think that I, I frame this as I think we're maturing to the point where we've probably gone from being worried only about the risks and we're actually saying, look, now there is opportunity here as well. And that opportunity is how is agriculture part of a solution rather than just a problem we should have less of? And, and I think that's how we need to frame food production generally and agriculture particularly as being a, a solution here to, to issues rather than just sort of minimising risk and, and being a smaller target, right? So, you know, there's a long way to go in that journey, but, but that's, I think, our, our reference now is, is that um, there are things that we need to do to, to feed the world, to make the world more habitable, to fix our climate, to, to you know, allocate scarce resources more fairly. And, and we need to be part of that rather than just trying to sort of say, look, that's not our job. It's, if that isn't our job, then I'm not sure what it is. So, so I sort of frame it around that. Um, I can go into detail. I don't, um, over to you in terms of um, telling me when you've heard enough, but um, you know, the, the, the issues for us are, are you know, both climate, water, animal pieces are the, are the headline for us. Yeah, thank you. If, um, yeah, Brett, would you like to add? Yeah, sure. So I think when it comes to impact, I think the most important thing is to start with metrics. Because um, before you put numbers behind impact, it's then really difficult to see where you're at, but also where you're trying to get to. So a really important step for us was we did some initial LCAs on some of our cheeses and we found that the footprint of, um, of our initial cheeses was actually still quite high. So it was two and a half times less than uh, some of the dairy cheeses we were um, replicating. So for example, our, our plant-based fondue was two and a half times less CO2 that it was emitting than the dairy fondue. But that to us still seemed quite high. So what we've done since is we've uh, swapped out the cashews. We're now using uh, ingredients such as white beans that can be grown from this part of the world. And the difference now is we're now looking at 20 to, to 25 times less CO2 just by swapping out that base ingredient. And uh, yeah, we obviously had to make sure that base ingredient had the same nutritional, same uh, components that are needed for cheese making. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was a step that we absolutely had to take. Um, and then of course, there's quite a lot we're doing with the transitional farming um, with local farmers here. Um, but perhaps I'll touch on that a little bit later. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pierre. What is your um, thought on that? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, we have started on the seaweed journey for sustainability reasons, and that was to offset the nutrient waste streams from aquaculture. That's where it started as marine systems ecologist. But now jumping forward um, 20 years and what I think we're doing, um, we're trying to introduce a new crop to the food chain. And so one of the larger uh, areas of um, having a more sustainable food system uh, that many uh, hear about all the time now is planning shifting to a more plant-based diet. Um, but I don't think uh, comparing seaweed to to um, uh, meat production is, is something that is relative um, and relevant to us here. So instead, I like to compare it to something like wheat. So in addition to shifting from meat to a plant-based diet to reduce um, global uh, resource impacts, um, shifting from uh, wheat-based diets to include seaweed, and we're not saying um, eliminate wheat at all because we sell, say, a pasta, and our pasta is sold with 10% seaweed in it. 
So if we say we could support or, or replace 10% of wheat production with seaweed, then that becomes a relevant measure of sustainability for us. So if we compare a, wheat, a hectare of wheat production with a hectare of seaweed production, um, we would be about 25% um, uh, more effective in lower carbon dioxide emissions. In One, because we're a, a smaller scale, two, because of uh, efficiency and rapid growth rates. Um, but basically we'd be 25% more than a hectare of wheat farming. Um, if we look at the nutrients, we're currently recovering nutrient waste streams from wheat processing. Um, and, and those nutrients are now then zero. We're eliminating the nutrient waste streams in a catchment area. And nitrogen pollution is a bigger pollution problem than many people appreciate. Uh, maybe Queensland and the Great Barrier Reef uh, threats from the land-based farming practices are probably the most well known, but otherwise nitrogen and other nutrient pollution along the coastline uh, is a big environmental impact that effectively we're eliminating. And we're utilizing a resource stream that otherwise cannot be used. It's wasted usually. Uh, then in terms of water, we're a saline production system. So we're probably, you know, 5% of the impact of wheat farming or 90% more efficient in water because we only use water to wash down some things now and then. We hardly, we don't, we just use salt water, which there's plenty on planet earth covered with 70% um, salt water. And then finally, in terms of biodiversity, because if we could replace uh, uh, wheat farming at say 10%, like I said, if all pasta had 10% seaweed in it, we effectively could remove 10% of land pressure from wheat farming. And 10% of the wheat farming area in Australia is over a million hectares. So that would, and we would be able to reduce over a million hectares down to 50,000 hectares of seaweed production. So that's quite a lot of hectares um, of biodiversity, soil use, um, and things that could be recovered um, uh, as well. So those are the key areas is you know, climate change emitting nutrients like CO2, water-based nutrients that are eutrophying coastlines and changing ecosystems, freshwater resources, and then the scale of food production so that we're not impacting on, on uh, natural biodiversity as much. Yeah, that's wonderful, Pia. Thank you for such an extensive answer. Um, so now we talked about um, how your companies are working towards reducing their emissions. So I'd just like to ask Amos a question. What do you think, what actions uh, should, should the food industry take in order to reduce emissions? So I think probably it's not about specific uh, technologies or a specific area of focus. I think it's more generally doing pre-competitive collaboration. So on the, the projects that we work on, we are largely company agnostic. So we partner with a sector. And so an example is the, the dairy sector here in, in New Zealand. And we partner with a, a large um, corporate farmer who has 15 farms and about 10,000 10, uh, cattle. And essentially we're running that corporate um, farmer's farms as a proof of concept for the whole dairy industry. And essentially what it's doing is we're growing lemon and sperma, which is a, a native strain of, I guess, duckweed here in New Zealand and using it as phytoremediation. So taking up some of the excess nutrients um, that run off from a pasture-based system growing that um, uh, duckweed in the, in the ponds and then harvesting it, drying it and feeding it back to the animals to replace some of the palm um, kernel extract that is given to dairy cattle as supplementary feed. So we've sort of looked around in one of the easiest ways that we think we can um, assist the dairy industry as a whole in New Zealand is by finding cost effective um, um, alternatives to bringing in palm kernel from overseas, recognizing some of the places that it comes from, um, it does significant ecological damage to those areas. So we're also kind of looking at not just in our direct backyard, but how can we look at the wider food system that our food system here in New Zealand interacts with and then mitigate some of the, the impact we have. And I think that the key part of this is that 
there's certain projects like this where the dairy industry kind of recognizes that it's not something that um, each, diff each company will hold as a competitive advantage, but it's something where knowledge can be shared and proof of concept shared so that it can actually take the entire industry up a level. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jack, would you like to add something to that? Um, I think that an important framing here too is um, uh, irrespective of what food comparisons we're sort of doing, I think it's it's much more important to think about what good practice and good performance looks like in any given food, right? So there's a whole spectrum of um, highly efficient, highly uh, low impact, um, highly nutritious foods. And there's the same food with really poor practice um, bundled in with that. And so understanding where every individual operation is within that spread is, is really important. And so, so comparisons between food types are hard to do, but you know, we, we do do them. Um, the comparison between good practice and, and the global average or the national average and poor practice is a, is a really important part for us to, to first of all understand what does that curve look like between you know, our spread of suppliers, if you like. Um, what is it that drives farmers to be in the, at the leading edge of that curve? And then how do you squash the curve so everyone ends up at the same end? Uh, I think that, you know, that opportunity with the existing technology is still very large and we've got a long way to go to sort of close that gap between what's average and what's their best performers. Um, I think that's the, the opportunity in front of us right now. Separately from that, we're relying on people like you who are soon going to have PhDs to sort of shift that whole curve because you've got brand new technology that we haven't got our heads around. But um, even squashing that curve is really an important opportunity that we've got in front of us right now. And... Um, that's that's probably where our focus is. Matt, would uh, Pia or Brad, would you like to add to that? Do you have any thoughts? We're we're seeing some um, momentum here in Europe about a um, a tax reduction for um, products that are emitting less, and this isn't well, what I like about this policy is it doesn't alienate any industry. So every single industry can reduce its CO2 so you can have carbon negative dairy um, you can have you know regenerative farming practices across the board so it's um, yeah it, it's basically open to anyone um, it is going to be difficult to adjudicate because indeed it's not just CO2 or emissions that need to be measured but also health metrics um, the nutrition of our food is also equally as important as, as well as the social aspects of the farmers livelihoods but um yeah i definitely think tax has a role to play there's been a lot of studies around uh the impact of introducing a sugar tax in both the uk and the us and those studies went really well um a big um leading cause of us uh, reducing the amount we smoke has been down to, to tax over the past couple of decades so the precedence is there um, unfortunately, uh, we, in an ideal world, it would all just happen uh, without us having to, to tax people or reduce tax. But um, yeah, human nature uh, doesn't often behave that way. So I, I think tax has a role to play in uh, um, yeah, helping us move forward faster. Yeah, I'll, um, if I will add then to that, Saskia, that, um, I agree that tax has a really important role and one influencing the purchaser directly through the price of things. Um, mm. uh, but also, uh, I guess, highlighting to the, to the consumer um, which, which choices they make are important in terms of reducing the carbon footprint. And I just want to raise, um, uh, I think, a little bit of a dilemma we've got here when um, many incentives, I guess, uh, in reducing carbon emissions uh, through sorts of credits. Um, and I can see that there's a lot of time and money, I would say bluntly wasted, because we end up with mm, entrepreneurs trying to jump on the bandwagon and selling their point of their business becomes making money off carbon credits. Whereas sometimes it actually doesn't necessarily produce um, a viable long-term or consumer needed product. Um, and I'll say a lot in the seaweed industry, for example, and you know, many people have said to me that you, know, you can grow 7% of the oceans with seaweed and capture all the carbon, but you can only do that as long as you sink the seaweed because otherwise it's just part of the cycle again. 
And so in that way, we capture carbon dioxide directly from a concentrated carbon dioxide source. And we're very efficient with our carbon dioxide system, but that's not how I count um, at, or would sell or market products in my company. I have not found an investor yet or a government that is gonna pay you to sink the seaweed to the bottom of the ocean because you're effectively sinking your money. So, so um, what I see is that we are running a seaweed into a food product that is 25% less of the carbon emission than comparable fruit, fruit ingredient products, in this case, wheat, uh, that I've been talking about. And, and that's going to be making a difference. Similarly, there's a, an, a, a big push for seaweeds that can reduce methane from cattle, for example. And I've seen stories like that before, where then there's a whole buzz and there's a whole movement to start growing this seaweed that would reduce burping from cattle. But um, you're going to be paying quite a lot for a very expensive cheese because the cost of growing that seaweed, the cost of extracting and making the molecule that will do that, when maybe the methane conversions can happen in, a, in an alternative way through um, uh, gut and feeding, uh, different feeding um, structures. Uh, I just see that there's a lot of, I've seen the bio, microalgae biofuels industry got invested $10 billion over 10 years and wasted that time on a blue sky promise that actually had no foundation in reality because you cannot compete with fossil fuel. So there is a danger sometimes um, in promoting um, credits, I would say, uh, and money to companies that can show they can reduce carbon emissions with some technology because the technology will not always be real. And we've wasted that time and money and, and opportunity in getting there. Whereas taxing, I think is a, is a much better way of getting there. Yeah, great. Um, I think it's also yeah, important, the role of the government in this whole movement. Um, but so we touched beforehand on the plant-based plant -based, uh, food products. Um, do you, and there's like a huge trend uh, about this. And um, so do you think that this trend influences companies uh, to join this movement towards um, yeah, either producing uh, plant, more plant-based food or make their food products more sustainable in a way? Um, I'm happy Red, to jump in. Jump in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think there definitely is. I, I think we are moving beyond the kind of green washing kind of era to a certain degree with, with food. I think every food company in the world is looking at plant-based products to a degree or, or the majority are um, the, their reasons behind it are maybe not the reasons we would want them to be you know I, I think a lot of the companies it's not altruism or environmentalism that is pushing people to look at it it's just the fact that there are so many customers looking for for plant-based goods um, I am kind of weary that the quality is there um, it takes years to design and create a quality product and yeah I think there's a lot of uh, shortcuts being made and uh, therefore bad impressions for the the first customer but by and large this is a very positive thing I think um, and yeah I do think most of the the major players and, and, and most of the things coming through are related to, to plant-based products so yeah, I, I can't speak in global terms because I really only know a, a decent amount about the US and Europe, but certainly in those two places, it's it's getting enormous, yeah. Yeah, but thanks for touching on that. I mean, um, I think the nutrition part in these plant-based food products is very important because they're mm. just getting on the market and like, yeah, you're getting almost overwhelmed by all these meat alternatives. So let me just ask this question uh, ahead. Um, so how could we ensure that these plant-based products are equally nutritious as animal derived products? Um, Jack, can you um, go ahead and? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's largely driven by consumers. I mean, they will, they will choose plant-based products because it brings things that they value. It brings a lower footprint or it brings a nutritional profile that they can't or a flavor profile that they can't get somewhere else. And then if they then discover that that 
particular product doesn't do what they thought it would, they will go back to where they were, right? So it's got to be a real alternative that does deliver real benefits. Um, and, and I think that the focus for whatever food production you're in will be, how do I lower my footprint? And, and you know, that involves just better practice, understanding where you are in that spread we talked about earlier um, and, and providing better nutrition um, and less discretionary calories because I think that's the other piece in this is, um, you know, so much of the world's calories are discretionary calories. Um, and as we exit those from our diets, then the concentration of good nutrients and, you know, I, I don't think any, any food source is different from that. The concentration of good nutrients in our diets will go up and, and hence the overall footprint can contract. Um, and I think we should not lose sight of that. So, so it's, it, it, consumer preference will drive this over time. I mean, there'll be some um, erratic responses, I think. And, and but over time, you know, they value good nutrition. They value a lower, a lower footprint. I suppose a lower footprint than today is a good measure of success. Um, and if you can't provide that, then you won't survive in business. I think that's, that's um, you know, going to be the world we go into. Right. Pierre, <laughs> you're ready to yeah i keen to add to that um i'm always i always um stay aware that if if everybody reduced their meat consumption and and or animal product consumption um even just 10 25 50 percent then that would do a, a lot more than everybody suddenly becoming uh, vegans and and so i'm keen to promote that everybody can have a role in this and uh, and uh, not to i guess put fear into people that you have to become a a, a pretty extreme vegan kind of person to to make the world sustainable because I think that message is important. Um, however, going to a total plant-based diet is a great thing if we can achieve it. But always there are there are steps towards getting there. Um, but the and then uh, the second thing is and that's also a way of making sure the transition in a nutritional sense because I think there will be many vegans who became vegans in the last five years who aren't informed enough to live as a vegan in terms of what they need for nutrition because there are some critical nutrients that come from animal products that we really do need including a lot of seafood um, omega-3s uh, now we're now we're using algae omega-3s which is the source of omega-3 but until they get to scale we're still going to need seafood and fish sources um, for these important long chain omega-3s um, like dha and epa um, uh, a lot of talk about the protein side can, of course, be solved through plants, and a number of people here are involved in that already. Um, uh, but surprisingly, as well, there's a lot of complementarity between different plants and seaweed. And our seaweed that we're growing has, once we've um, got a broken our seaweed into two streams, it's 30% protein with all the essential amino acids in its dried state, and and we also can concentrate that to about 50-60% protein. And, and we could go even further with more processing, but just with a simple um, protein rich fraction that we use, it's 60% protein, all essential amino acids. And then in terms of addressing nutritional deficiencies in a plant-based diet, seaweed's putting back a lot of the nutritional deficiencies um, in uh, the, all diets as they stand today, including a lot of the trace elements that are deficient in land. So iodine, iron, we have very bioavailable iron in, in the seaweeds. And also seaweeds have B12, which is a vitamin that is usually goes missing for, for vegan diets. So uh, adding seaweed to all of the new plant-based diets would be a good thing. Thank you. Amos, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think more standardization within um, protein comparisons because I think the really good um, plant-based companies are probably getting um, punished a little bit by some of the, the greenwashing companies or companies that are just tagging along and you see claims about you know, green superfood and then you, you dig down into the actual ingredients and you see that you know, really the, the bioavailability or even the digestibility um, of some of the amino acids might be um, might compromise what their claim is on the front. So I think it's about trying to ensure that there's a, a really high, high standard around marketing and branding and food labeling to make sure that the, um, the people that do the hard work around clinical studies and, and getting really high quality um, food products out there aren't punished at the shelf 
um, in terms of the R&D costs that they've had and they're trying to recoup because I see people grab stuff off the shelf that looks flashy or sounds good, but it, it doesn't necessarily have the, the backing of, um, of science. So I think more work done around also labeling and, and branding and what you, you can or cannot say about a, um, about a product because, you know, you, you also have this situation where some of the, the plant-based milks, they, they have broad claims, you know, um, with all the goodness of dairy, um, and the reality is, is that if you look at the, the labeling, they just, they don't have all the goodness of dairy. And sometimes there's a direct comparison of, of one, um, I guess, one nutritional element. But if you were to hold them up side by side and do, a, do testing on it, you would see that would actually really fall short. So then if there is a, a company that works really hard to bolster a plant-based milk with various nutrients, um, they get punished by the same thing where people like me look at it and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious because of what I've, I've seen already in the, in the market. And then even on the sustainability side, I think it's well known um, now that, that almond milk has some, some serious issues with its credentials because of the, the water supply that, that almonds take up, especially in, in California where a lot of them are grown. And so to, um, to, for people to say that no dairy is not sustainable, but almond milk is because it's plant-based and this is animal-based, it's not really a true comparison. So I think it's being really um, honest about the, the whole story. So we have a, um, a current trend in New Zealand where there's a lots of um, quinoa. So anything from quinoa milk to vegetable patties that have been bolstered with quinoa protein. And that's fine, but actually if you look at some of the development reports coming out of parts of South America, like Peru, there's actually now widespread um, um, nu nutritional deficiencies in some of those communities because the price of their quinoa has just shot through the roof and it's all being shipped off in massive containers and then turning up in Western countries where they're reconstituting it or they're um, reformulating it into a finished food product. So then they put that on the shelf and they say that, you know, this is a much better sustainability story than, than dairy or whatever it is that they're trying to, to be. But you've got a, a, a naturally, you've got a bit of a dark and dirty um, off target consequence there happening in some of the communities where those products came from. So I think more, more transparency around both the nutritional side of claims on, and plant-based foods and also the, um, uh, the, the supply chain transparency. And then it will give consumers like myself much more confidence to purchase them because I, I feel like I know that what they are representing is what they actually are. Yeah, great. I think, um, yeah, we've touched um, on like the fact that these plant-based alternatives are not necessarily healthier, more sustainable. Um, so Amos and you mentioned that it's important to, to be transparent so um, for the consumers, but how can we effectively communicate um, also what's behind the product, like the food science, to ensure consumers make well-informed decisions when they purchase their products? Essentially, you can't. <laughs> I think... <laughs> You know, I think history has shown us that because, you know, people bought into the, the fact that fats were bad at one stage. And then I see people now um, posting on their, their Facebooks that, um, that calories are a hoax. Or uh, I think that, you know, social media has, in fact, made it much more difficult to get that clear message across about nutritional science. And uh, the sad r reality is, is that... Um, for probably most of um, most of you, when you think about your purchasing decisions, it's actually really not in line with the purchasing decisions of the average consumer, or perhaps a large proportion of it. Of it, and um, you know, it's hard to forget everything we know about food. But there's lots of people that that don't have that knowledge, and they tend to just be nudged along by traditional marketing and, and gimmicks. And if you look at um, I think some of the newspaper articles and so-called opinions that come out as well, I think it's really difficult for the average consumer to navigate it because you have a scientist on one side that's saying something and then it looks like something contradictory on the other side. So I, I think it's a really difficult challenge to communicate that science to consumers. And so what it comes down to is um, building trustworthy brands 
And so you have that brand trust and that brand credibility. So people will better believe what you're telling them about the product. If you just go out with the, the, the nutritional science and, and explain about digestibility and how, you know, even people have different um, um, microbiota in their gut and what's good for one person may not be good for another. I think people just get lost along the way and they just want to grab something off the shelf. So I think that the key is to build credibility um, around your brand rather than trying to um, educate every consumer about the nutritional science behind your product. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. I think uh, you said many truthful things. I think, Brad, since you are just put on the market your new food products, uh, what are your thoughts on this? You know, it's very difficult to communicate all of those things on a very small package. I mean, our packages here in Europe, we have so many different languages. So we've made the package available in German, French, Dutch, and English. And yeah, that already is taking up quite a bit of space. But I would love to have, because we have nutritional comparisons with the dairy cheese we replace. We have um, certain ingredients which we put in there because we know that plant-based eaters um, do have certain deficiencies. Um, we have certain stories we want to tell about our impact. And also the backstory of my grandfather on, on there as well. So there's a lot of information to communicate in a tiny place. Um, so I think it's about, yeah, getting the, the person to try it. And then as they become more and more aware of the brand, um, then they can, yeah, find the other kind of deeper parts of information. But really the responsibility lies with us as much as with the customer. And we, we, we have to, you know, really... Um, take the position we have and, and make sure we're doing things in, um, yeah, well, the best practice we can essentially. And from a customer perspective, I think we all just need to question what we're eating a bit more. Um, and yeah, really think about every product that, that we buy because indeed there is a lot of um, clever marketing out there and, and yeah, kind of uh, a lot of people pulling the wool over our eyes. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not a, an easy question to answer or an easy solution. It's uh, really something that uh, is ever evolving. And um, the responsibility lies with both the customer and the product or the producer. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Um, Pierre. You would hope to be the retailer, but uh, the retailers are, yeah, they're just putting things on shelves. They're, those are the, you know, some of the people who could start to... Um, you know change things at greater scale but yeah they just uh care about the price <laughs> yeah uh yeah so uh, we've ended up um venus shell systems was the seaweed farming company that i started and when i started that we were standing there with bags of green seaweed powder going which food manufacturers <laughs> want to buy this and there was no one really knew what to do with it or how to work with those flavors or even understood the nutritional story behind it and because I was coming from academia and we'd done clinical studies and we've uh, done a lot of nutrient analysis and, um, and we've grown the seaweed in different ways. So we know if we grow it this way, it's actually low in protein. If we grow it that way, it's higher in omega-3 than omega-6. But if you grow it that way, it's higher in omega-6 than omega-3. So we know those things. But then we realized, gee, we've got all this information. It's really up to us to start communicating it. And we realized then that we would just have to we just have to show people how to put seaweed into pasta. It's not just sushi. You can put seaweed into everyday food products. We have it in muesli, have it in muesli bars, pasta, seaweed corn chip snacks, so that people can get a little bit of seaweed easily and quickly because that's the way people eat today. Um, and I, I think that um, what, what you were uh, speaking about before, um, yeah, Amos is that the, the brand and the trustworthy brand is where we've sort of just ended up organically because we now have a close communication with our consumer because we're putting on the line our reputation and what we know about our seaweed and we're telling that story and the con consumer is responding and we're responding to them and we're growing with them um, and so we're growing that that brand and the, and the research and the nutritional health benefits that some of them are, are realizing as well together um, and the trustworthy brand many companies are now asking us for our ingredient 
you know, five years later, we were like, oh, well, now we have it. <laughs> We've got it in our brand. So we're only using it in our brand at the moment because that's all we can, we can make enough for. Um, and one day we'll be uh, allowing other brands to use it as well. But um, we, we're going to grow the story and reputation of what we're doing uh, is really important to us first. Because if you then give it to another brand as well, you, just like you were saying, there's marketing out there that would probably turn it into some kind of weird superfood doing things beyond what it actually can do. Um, and that is a risk as well to us. And so we're just holding on to it and growing the brand ourselves at the moment. So there's a good fundamental basis, at least in our small customer base and that growing story uh, and information about seaweed that we put online through our blog now on iodine, which is a regular question we get from customers, you know, the new protein um, profile that we've got in our seaweeds. Um, iron bioavailability and how that can be really important in today's um, iron deficient um, society. Um, those stories we're putting up online and, and growing the brand uh, trust in that way. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, Jack is such a big corporate. What do you think uh, is the, the best way? I think, I think as a big corporate, we've got an opportunity and responsibility to do things at scale. So um, Pia talked before about, for example, like using seaweed as a methane inhibitor in cows being, you know, in a lab it makes sense, but at a commercial scale it doesn't make sense. It's, it's too expensive, it's hard to do, um, there's risk involved with it. And, and I think people like or organisations like Fonterra have the ability to say, well, well, how do we make that make sense? How do we actually bring that down to low cost and do it large enough? And I think, you know, Solar panels are a classic example of that. I mean, PV panels a long time ago, not that long ago, were very expensive and made no sense. And now they are the cheapest form of electricity in the world. And, and we've just got to come up with business models that actually make these solutions that are, that are you know, quite embryonic into something that are just, just makes sense for all of us. And, and despite the reluctance of our governments to solve these problems for us, then businesses have businesses with a big footprint have the ability to go and create these solutions and make them commercially viable. I think that's the role of big corporates here. And um, as consumers, we can choose who we partner with every day and, and we need to be partnering with people who are who are going down that journey to make it better. Um, I, I think brand's important. I think we talked about that trust. And I think the, you know, the opportunity, I think, in this sort of you know, COVID world, I suppose, is that it's probably likely that people are going to be looking to scientists for solutions here. And the value of science and, and you know, um, and uh, all the people on this call probably do value science. Uh, the value of science will become more apparent quite quickly, I think, as we sort of navigate our way through this. And we should absolutely exploit that to make sure that people go, okay, so our scientific knowledge and institutions and methodologies are valuable to the world and, we're, and we've proven that and we'll, we'll keep proving that through immunological sort of research. Let's not lose that opportunity to consolidate science as being something that is something that can be trusted and is something that can be valued and help some of those things that, that Amos and the others pointed out where we've got to cut through some of this noise. Um, the next you know, six to 12 months is a, is a great opportunity to do that. And, and so, you know, all of our organisations, large and small, need to sort of latch onto that and go, don't, don't miss this opportunity. Great, thank you. I think we are slowly reaching the end of this session. So at this point, I will open up the questions to the uh, uh, open up the floor to the to the audience to ask questions. I think we had quite a few interesting ones already in the chat. Um, one of them is actually uh, to you, Jack. Um, so as Fonterra is committed to animal welfare, what new technologies or strategies are currently in use? Um, I mean, I, I suppose it's just continual monitoring of animals both remotely and you know using webcams and cameras and 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 actually their their um you know temperature sensors their their feed outputs so so it doesn't rely on a, on a skilled individual to be with the animals all the time anymore we actually can set up systems that are, enable early detection of things that were not visible and so animals that have issues are are able to be identified and, and whatever interventions needed can happen much, much earlier and, and we can, you know, feed them differently or put them in a different place or move them or not move them or whatever it takes to, to make their, their, their comfort and their health um, you know, much more apparent. I, I think the, 
the technology available to do that allows skilled individuals to to look after more animals and requ requires uh, how do I put this? It means those that are less skilled or less attuned to animals' needs, they don't need to be with the animals. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I can I can jump in and uh, I work quite quite a lot currently on a few projects with with Fonterra dairy farmers or Fonterra suppliers here in, in New Zealand, and I've seen a, um, a, a huge willingness from the farmers to engage um, with Fonterra's support to look at a wide range of, of technologies. And it's sort of, it's also based off not just technology, but um, uh, increasing the, like the philosophical viewpoint. So as in New Zealand, we have the system of five freedoms. You know, an animal should be free to be itself in its environment. An animal should be free to get water or feed when it needs to. You have this sort of, philosophical model and then you build up technology around it and a great example of a new technology that I've seen trialed here is a it's actually a camera that monitors it and has machine learning built in so that it can begin to detect early signs of lameness in the animal for example and so we're actually getting even better at preventing animals from um, becoming uncomfortable in their natural environment. I think um, actually back to, to Jack's point earlier on about distribution across an, an industry, you know, I would say the, the vast majority of farmers that I come across, they really actually love their animals, care for their animals, know most of their animals, and they can and identify ones with sort of quirky personality traits. And, and, and then actually that, they're not really the problem. They're always looking for ways to make their, um, to make their animal welfare better. It's a small percentage of what I would say poor performers or um, laggards in the standards and still have this kind of mentality of sort of dominance over animals. And, you know, frankly, I don't think um, any sort of technology or improvement in, in philosophy is going to help them because they seem to have a, an arrogance and a, a disregard for, for animals in general. And it's unfortunate because that's what we get in the news a lot in, in New Zealand is because when that happens, it's on the front page. And frankly speaking, it, it is horrible. And some of the things that, that I've seen from the um, livestock industry, it's, it is, it's frankly disgusting. But it's such a small portion of the farmers that, that I interact with and meet. And so I think, you know, the ones that are, are in that general majority of, of wanting to do better, they are leaping onto any new technologies they can. And there's some really exciting ones coming. Could I just add a short note in there too, Saskia, on the end? Um, we don't work with animals per se, but I also think that this movement into better human nutrition has already, in earlier than human nutrition, been in the animal sector. And I think that that's continuing to uh, be implemented. And the overuse, for example, of things like antibiotics now can be overcome through better diets and feeding animals more the foods that they're supposed to be eating. Uh, just like we're now trying to feed humans more the foods that they're supposed to be eating. And so animal mm -hmm. diets with the, the new plant-based plant foods chains were, will also be part of animal welfare. Yeah. And I had one thing to that as well. Um, <laughs> there's a brilliant book called Drawdown, which um, basically sets out 80 different um, ways in which we can re reduce CO2 over the next uh, 30 years, so before 2050. And there's quite a few tips for um, dairy agriculture. And one of them is silver pasturing. So rather than having dairy um, or, or cattle, sorry, just grazing in an open field, you have them grazing in a woodland. And they can then get a lot of the, the feed that they are, or they traditionally ate. So um, branches and, you know, all, all kinds of wild um, kind of things that are growing there and uh, yeah the the land is far more nutritious you have two things combining so you have a forest which is capturing co2 and you also have an environment where the cattle are a bit more or a bit less exposed to the conditions so in an open field there's you know on a really hot day crazy sun and then a horrible uh, cold day yeah a, a hell of a lot of rain and wind um, so uh, yeah that's also a technique that um is getting a lot of um, attention and uh, yeah, uptake. Yeah, wow, super interesting. Thanks for sharing this. Um, so we do have many PhD students um, working on sustainable food research here in our institute. And uh, one of our professors, um, oh, uh, 
I think, oh, Heather, I'm sorry. I thought it was, I missed the name. So Heather, Heather uh, Shewin, she, she raised a, a question. How can we prepare our graduates, particularly from engineering or science to support uh, the sustainability initiatives? Um, like existing graduates, do they know how to formulate products and do they consider product life cycles to improve sustainability? I know how to go with that. So uh, look, I, I just encourage all of the graduates and, and those that are nearly graduated is, is to just get better at telling your story, right? So, so you know, the, the, the knowledge you've got and the innovations you bring, um, just park the perfection race here and just tell your story because we've really got to get more connected to our communities and to consumers. And, and to do that, we have to be communicators, not just scientists. And so, so, so you know, learn what you can learn, but then tell your story and, and just get out there and keep doing it because that will build all of our credibility and make it easier for us all. Thank you. Um, anyone else something to add? I, I think, um, sorry, Pierre, I think you're about to say something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think doing something you're passionate about, so whatever project you embark on, make it something you're really passionate about um, because uh, working life is now going to be quite long. I think we're all going to be working until our 70s or 80s. And uh, yeah, it seems like a simple thing to say, but um, I've I've got a lot of friends still who 10 years into their working life still haven't found something they really connect with. So whatever project you, you go for, make sure you start with ones you you really enjoy because if in 20 years time you don't find something you can enjoy, maybe then you can do something that's a bit more of a grind, but certainly uh, yeah, for the, the first 20 years of your career, really seek something that you enjoy because you'll get so much more out of it and it will never feel like work. Yeah. Yeah my contribution was just to say that I think that it's really important that students um, appreciate where their niche and focus of research fits in the bigger picture. And sometimes historically that's been the problem is that people are so focused on their little um, technical molecular detail, um, but lose sight of it. There might actually be a lot simpler solution to this global challenge than shifting that in the molecular design or something. So just keeping uh, a context of where your research fits in the big picture. But I think that's sort of happened now. And, and now I, I get many people approaching me and saying, oh, I want to study seaweeds and, 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 and you know, do what we're doing and, and understand sustainability. And sustainability is really big. So I will emphasize here that the traditional food science um, and the traditional skill sets are now the things that are really important to me. I'm not employing more seaweed scientists and I'm not really employing life cycle and analysts. We know we're doing a sustainable business, but now I need people that can actually do the chemistry that's traditionally done in foods. And it's not my background field of expertise in science either. So I really appreciate uh, learning from the existing food labs and growing with them uh, in terms of the new areas of science. And we don't need lots of seaweed scientists. We need lots of molecular chemists, nutritionists, um, plumbers and, and uh, processing equipment. I'm, I'm adopting processing equipment from the wine industry, from the dairy industry, from the meat industry. And I'm learning how all of these work. And then how does that process actually affect the product, the different drying technologies and things like that. So the existing and the traditional skill sets are still so vital and they can now just be applied into the future of new technologies. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. We are running out of time, we ran out of time now, but I would just like to ask you one last question. Um, so the answer should be very short, maybe just one sentence, like it doesn't have to be very elaborate. So what do you think would, is the future of food? Jack, you're unmuted, <laughs> you're ready to go. <laughs> Look, it, it might become and probably will become more plant-based, but there is a role for animals in sustainable agriculture for soil remediation, for nutrient recycling, um, and for some of the things that I mentioned in the drawdown conversation that, that Brad talked about. I mean, drawdown's a really good reference, and if you go away with nothing else, then go, go get drawdown. But, but I think it's a mix of, of plant and animal nutrition. Thank you. Um, 
I of course have to say seaweed, but at least 10%. But really, um, the, 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 the second and, and third things I think are, well, the second main thing is, is diversity. So we need to keep up a diversity of foods. And that does mean you don't, you don't have to reject meat outright, even if you have it once a month or even once a year, let's just not have it seven nights a week like we used to. And, and then on top of that, diversity, because diversity will uh, allow us adaptability in environmental and nutritional aspects. Um, and yeah, for our health, it's vital. So we need to increase diversity in our food. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say a flexitarian diet. And I would say it's a diet where we understand the impact that everything we eat has on the planet, but also our own health as well. Yeah, I would say a personalized approach to food and a closer relationship between food and health. Wonderful. <laughs> I think this was our last sentence. Very um, um, motivating. So thank you guys for joining. Thank you, Amos. Thank you, Pia. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Brad. Um, this, was, this was a great session. Um, thank you to the audience. Thank you to, to the questions. And the session was recorded. It will be uploaded on Spotify very soon. So you can listen to it in a podcast. Um, yeah, so yeah. we'll stay in touch and see you soon. Thank, thank you, you everyone for being with us for these three sessions if you have been. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we hope you enjoy. Yes. See you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye, folks.